Okay. So I want to talk today about singular value decomposition. And I want to think about this as a generalization of what we talked about in the previous video, which was the spectral theorem. So the spectral theorem says that if we have a symmetric matrix that has an orthonormal eigenbasis, in other words, they're orthonormal vectors, V1 through Vn, says that AVJ is lambda JVJ. And in yet other words, we could write A as UDU transpose for some orthogonal matrix U. By the way, a lot of what's gonna happen in this lecture is just saying the same concept in different words with different perspectives. A lot of learning math is learning to think about things in one way and another way and in yet another way and learning to see them all related to each other. And so you'll expect to see a lot of this in other words coming up here. Okay, so what can we say for a matrix which is not symmetric? Maybe it's not even square. Well, the related statement is singular value decomposition. So this says if you have an M by N matrix that has a singular value decomposition, I'm going to tell you what that is. A singular value decomposition is M orthonormal vectors in Rm and N orthonormal vectors in Rn and scalars sigma 1, sigma 2, and so forth, such that A, V, J is sigma J, U, J. In other words, we can write A is UDV transpose for two orthogonal matrices, U and V, and a diagonal matrix D. So here is an example of a more or less random singular value decomposition. And I deliberately chose a non-square example to show you how that works. So <clears throat> here is my original matrix M. Here is my U. The columns of U are U1, U2, U3. These are an orthonormal basis of R3. The rows of V are V1, V2. This is an orthonormal basis of R2. Here in the middle, is my diagonal matrix D. And it's a little bit funny since it's not square, but still all the non-zero entries are on the diagonal. These are the singular values. And we have that when we multiply M times these vectors V1, V2, we get these vectors U1, U2, U3 times these scalars. And so I'm gonna be writing that out on the next few slides. And let's see if this will fit. Okay, need to erase this quarter. So here, so just moving this V and this U so we don't run into things. There we go. So these matrices U and V are orthogonal matrices, meaning that their rows and columns are orthonormal bases. And if I multiply M times this first vector V1, this vector, if I multiply, sorry, not doing well drawing today. If I multiply M by this vector V1 here, Then I get sigma one, this scalar here, times u one, that's this vector, sorry, that's this vector here. And the same thing with, if I multiply m times v two, the second row vector, and I get the singular, second singular value times the second singular vector over here. Okay. And so let's just make sure. To, so here are two statements I said are the same thing in other words. And let's see why. So we're saying there are orthonormal vectors, orthonormal bases for Rm and for Rn. 
and scalar sigma, so it's the A, V, J, sigma, J, U, J. I said that's the same thing as A is U, D, V transpose. Well, U is going to have columns U1 through UM. V is going to have columns V1 through VN, but then they get transposed, so there'll be rows over here. So the equations A, V, J, sigma, J, U, J, that can be written as a single matrix equation. A times the matrix whose columns are the Vs is sigma 1, U1, sigma 2, U2, blah, 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 sigma M, U, M, which is the matrix whose columns are the Us times the diagonal matrix of sigmas. So this says that A, V is U, D. Now multiply both sides on the right by V inverse, which is V is orthogonal is the same as V transpose, and we get A is U, D, V transpose. So these are a compact matrix way or an expanded out geometric way of saying the same thing. There's an orthonormal basis for RM, which is taken by A to an orthonormal basis for RN times some scalars. So let's see what this looks like geometrically. So just like in my last picture, here's my happy face. And here's my happy face multiplied by a matrix. And this time the matrix is not symmetric. Here are the singular values. Here are the singular vectors. So this red vector, which goes just behind the eye, beneath the eye of smiley face, goes to this red vector, which goes just beneath the eye of this smiley face. This blue vector, which shoots up over the bridge of the nose, goes to this blue vector right here. And we see that U1 is perpendicular to U2, and they're the same length, they're orthonormal. V1 is perpendicular to V2. I drew sigma 1 V1 and sigma 2 V2, so you don't see the Vs themselves. We can still see that they're perpendicular to each other. They're all so orthonormal. The length of, so here's U1, Here's U1. V1 has length one. So sigma one V1. Has length sigma one. And similarly this over here is sigma two V2. It has length sigma two. <clears throat> And notice these are not eigenvectors. You can see that they're not eigenvectors because V1, this red vector, is not pointing in the same direction as U1, this red vector. And V2, this blue vector, is not pointing in the same length as V2. If we had eigenvectors, then they would be pointing in the same directions. And to emphasize that contrast, here's a picture of the eigenvectors. So here I have now drawn the eigenvectors of this matrix. This red eigenvector is sent over to here. This blue eigenvector is negated and sent to over here. You can see that, yeah, this is parallel to this, and this is parallel to this. So they're eigenvectors, but they are not orthonormal. This angle is clearly an acute angle, and this angle is clearly an obtuse angle. So when we flip back and forth to our two pictures, singular vectors, you stay at this nice right angle, but there's some global rotation. Eigenvectors, there's no rotation, everything stays parallel, but you don't have a right angle, except for a symmetric matrix where you get both things at once. That was, look back at the pictures on the previous slide lecture, if you wanna see a picture where I did use a symmetric matrix. This one is not a symmetric matrix. Okay, and then I want to give you uh, one more perspective on singular values. So remember, we said at the end of the previous lecture video that for a symmetric matrix, the eigenvector, the largest eigenvector, is the greatest stretching of that matrix. It's the longest that A, W can be if W has length one. And something similar is going to be true of singular vectors the largest singular value will be the largest value of AX for any X of length one, and sigma N will be the smallest. And let's see why. Well, the Vs are an orthonormal eigenbasis, so write X in terms of them. 
As it's an orthonormal eigenbasis, we have the usual geometric formula, the Pythagorean theorem, sum of Cj squared is one. So then Ax is C1 sigma one U1 plus blah, blah, plus Cn sigma Nun. This is very similar to the computation with eigenvectors, except, it's not, except we have to keep track of the difference between V and U. And so the length of Ax is by the Pythagorean theorem, square root C1 squared sigma one squared plus blah, 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 Cn squared sigma N squared. That's going to be at its largest if we take C1 squared to be one and the other terms to be zero, that's going to be at its smallest if we take Cn squared to be one and the other terms to be zero. Why does this matter? One reason it matters is that this means that the largest singular value is a good heuristic for how big is this matrix. If you want a statistic to measure how big is a matrix, the largest singular value is a pretty good statistic for that. And you know, they have the smallest singular value is a good statistic for how close does this matrix come to having a kernel. So for square matrices, we learned a while ago that the matrix has a kernel if we determine it to zero. But we didn't learn anything like that for non-square matrices. And we didn't have any approximate statement. We didn't have any, it is not true that if the determinant is close to zero, that the matrix is close to having a kernel. But it is true that if the smallest singular value is small, then the matrix is close to having a kernel. So a lot of what singular values are used for is when you're doing inexact computation, computation with measurement errors and rounding errors, you can look at the singular values and if they're close to zero, you can say, oh, this is close to being a matrix with kernel, a matrix with low rank. And this gets into things like low rank approximation. Oh, and uh, I didn't think I had this slide, but I do. I'll just keep talking. So this slide says a bunch of things I just said. Sigma one is a measure of how big A is. If sigma one is big, then A stretches some vectors a lot. And sigma n is a measure of how close A comes to having a kernel. If sigma n is small, but some vectors are mapped to very small vectors by A. Okay, and that is the actual last slide. All right. Um, well, I have not yet told you how to compute singular values and singular vectors. That's the subject of the next video.